and welcome everybody uh, to the latest CTO bite, uh, Craft Bite Size. Today we'll be looking at compliance in the cloud, heaven or hell. If it's your first time at CTO uh, Craft Bites, let me tell you a little bit more about the group. Uh, so it's a mentoring and coaching community for technology leaders around the world, focusing on supporting technologists in their leadership growth. Community members are over 7,000 and the CTO Craft provides them with one-to-one -one coaching, mentoring, a curated Slack community and events like this one. So a huge thank you to our headline partner, AWS, for helping us make these Bytes events possible. Uh, so I'm Anna Dick. I'm CTO at a recruitment tech business called Hiring Hub and a non-exec director at TechNation. And we've got three um, excellent panelists with us today. So I'm just going to introduce uh, each one of those and let them tell them a little bit about themselves. So Ed, do you want to start? Certainly. Thank you very much, Anna. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I am Ed Adario, currently CTO of Salary Finance, who is a lender with a social conscience. So if you want to know any, a little bit more about who we are and what we do, please do go to the usual www.salaryfinance.com. And I have been working in technology really pretty much all, all my professional life and then some, mostly uh, financial services, but I did have a bit of a stint in telecom and, and manufacturing. Great. Thanks, Ed. And uh, Aubrey, Aubrey Sturm. Hello. Well, hi, Anna. Um, I'm an interim CTO by trade um, and a fractional CTO. Uh, I work for various people throughout the year. Um, of a long history as a developer, uh, as a cloud native developer, um, working with infrastructure. Um, I'm very passionate about security. Um, and I have a very nerdy interest in regulation, which is why today's talk is so interesting. <laughs> Having spent seven months last year building a language to describe regulation um, as code, this is definitely a passion subject of mine. Fab, that's great. Thanks, Aubrey. And Glyn? Hi, yes, I'm Glenn Roberts. I'm CTO of Digital Solutions at iTech Art. We're a web development company, mainly offering staff augmentation with three and a half thousand developers based in Belarus, some in Ukraine, some in Poland. That's a different topic, of course, right now. Um, and yeah, my history, I've, uh, I've worked in health tech for a little bit as well as head of platform. I've been consulting in multiple organizations as part of iTech Art. In some cases that are involving like the security piece, like with security questionnaires and helping alignment with the business and some, some of their compliance needs as well. Cool, fab, thank you. Um, so let's get started. Oh, I think if you think about a question while we're chatting away, there's a ask a question link that you can add your question there. And we'll save a bit of time at the end if that isn't answered along the way for you. Okay, so let's get started. I think we were going to start with, uh, with a question to you, Ed. So there's lots of different compliance needs across different industries and lots of different tech that can be involved in that. Can you give us a quick introduction to what we mean by compliance in this kind of context? Wow, that okay. That that's a really really interesting question. I mean, I and I think look, when talking to to regulation and compliance in general, I mean, it's probably easier just to talk about in the UK. There is about over certainly over a hundred of regulatory bodies. Some of those will have a statutory power. Some others will have some legal powers, and some other are just <clears throat> bodies of best practice which even though they will not have uh, compulsory uh, powers to implement certain rules and regulations, they are nevertheless seen as best practice. So, and, and it really doesn't matter in which area, in which space you happen to be working on. I mean, if you are a charity, then you have to contend with the likes of the Charity Commission on Wales, for example. If you happen to be on education, then of course you have Ofqual, you have Ofsted, uh, environmental, then if you are in Northern Ireland, then you have, of course, the environmental agency of Northern Ireland. If you are in the financial space, oh my God, then you have the usual, all the uh, all the three-letter acronyms. You have the SEA, the PSR, the Lending Commission, the CONC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the list doesn't stop there. If you are in healthcare, if you are in housing, if you're in communications, if you are in energy markets, the list is just endless. And, and as I said, I mean, it's easier to count the bodies rather than the actual regulations because, you know, it, it's a huge number. And that's just in the UK. God forbid if you're trying to go into other geographies, not regions. No, so in a nutshell, I guess, regulation 
and the need to be compliant, it, it boils down to either do the right thing or be on the right side of the law. An ideal, do both. Great. And what, it, from your experience, do you think are the key challenges of the of being compliant or, or kind of striving for compliance? Yeah. And in this context, I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on the statutory compliance side of things. So, so you know, the typical FCAs of the world, etc. <clears throat> and and I think that the challenges are going to be different based on, on, on which stage of, of the evolution you happen to be in as, as a company. I mean, the challenges that a startup or a pre-seed company is going to be facing are, real, are fairly different, for example, from the ones that a scale up are going to be facing and ultimately the ones that an SME or established company are going to be facing up. And if there is a common pattern in all of these, it probably has to do with what is the volume of business or the volume of transactions that you're going to be generated? So one of the things that I believe that the UK has a significant advantage compared to other regulatory bodies across different countries is that there is a recognition that you have to be proportional. So there are certain rules that it really doesn't matter if you're small or large, you just have to comply with, end of the story. But what the, the 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 uk government has been doing is is making that proportion if you are a startup probably the biggest challenge is going to be about just knowing what are the regulations that you have to to comply with mm -hmm. once you are getting more into this into the scale up phase so you have already a, a uh, a going concern, you're already transacted, potentially you already have customers and there's a line of revenue already under your books, then at that stage is making sure that the compliance becomes uh, part of the business. It's just business as usual, rather than, oh my God, I forgot we needed to do that. And once you are an established company, again, the volumes are going to grow, the expectation of the different regulatory bodies are going to grow. So it's all about making sure that mm -hmm. you are you have the proper controls, you're in a position to report your status at any point in time, and more importantly, that you are providing the respective regulatory bodies with information or the reports or the updates that it will be required throughout the time. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And Glenn, you work with a lot of startups. What, um, from your view, are, are, the, are the challenges different or um, similar, but but um, more or or less? What's sure. Um, with startups at normally earlier stage, there's 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 quite a few different challenges to what obviously more established businesses face. So just with the actual team that you have, you know, you won't have a specialist with inside the organization that's been through this before. In most cases, uh, a lot of times the CTO will just be the person responsible. So therefore, the CTO has to get to speak very quickly with that domain or whatever needs to be in place for that organization. And even with the existing team, you know, if you've the, the people that work in startups have normally worked in lots of other types of smaller startups as well. So therefore they're not used to the big organizations, the big processes that are in place, the training that's already been put in place of the expectations of following these regulations. So it's all completely new to them and they're not experienced with doing that. They're used to just building things and breaking things fast, you know, so they can actually get the product out the door. Um, and obviously now as well, a lot of the teams are working remotely. You know, two years ago, it was mainly the more smaller startups that are working remotely, but obviously that's a similar issue for large organizations as well now. So obviously that takes an impact into your compliance needs. Um, so with small organizations, they still need to be delivering fast. They have a smaller team, so they still need to be producing valuable products out of the door. So it's very rare to have anyone that can focus 100% on their compliance needs as what a, log a large organization could do with obviously more funding to be able to allocate resources to that. And even when it comes to like third party suppliers, you know, when they were building the product, it was what's the cheapest or what's the easiest for me to incorporate in. There was no consideration about um, any compliance needs around that. Um, so, but, you know, again, the, the, the issue that they all need to face is the risk reward ratio. And I think smaller startups are much more concerned about the risk part than larger organizations. Larger organizations are able to feel comfortable about what the risk is and what the cost is to mitigate that and just accept the risk in certain cases uh, where smaller startups, they'll probably feel there's a heavier barrier to say, well, actually, if I'm going to enter into the fintech space, I need to be compliant with all these things. It's going to be too hard for me to even start this business from that perspective as well. 
So I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what this is, especially with the proportionality that Ed was talking about, you know, like GDPR, it sounds really scary. It's going to be 20% of your annual annual revenue, which for a small organization, oh, that's fine. Or 20 million, whichever one's larger and 20 million is a lot of money to, an, to a very small startup. So um, yeah, that's, that's one of the big issues that exists right now about the proportionality piece and understanding what you can and can't do in the smaller states. That's what I normally see. Yeah. Okay, great. And I think you mentioned there about the CTO in the smaller companies of it often having to pick up. I've got personal experience having been through that quite recently with GDPR um, and the compliance standards were very difficult to understand and get my head around, you know, and that's one of many that you could, you know, you could have for an organization as it grows. So Aubrey, what's your experience of these and how, how do you translate them to, especially to developers? Actually, I think just by saying that, you've hit the nail on the head. If, if we look at how the people that tend to consume these regulations, we are largely, most of us, digital businesses these days. We are technology-led. The implementation happens on the front lines with our engineers. And you have to look at these things and say, are they fit for consumption? If you look at like what ultimately the end goal of what we want from these things, we want them to be effective. We want the regulation to be adopted. We need them to be consumable when you read these things, are they consumable? I mean, your reaction to, to reading GDPR was the perfect example of this doesn't feel consumable. It's, it's largely legalese. It's not built for, for your audience. So what I would say is I think we, we largely lack a standard to communicate these things. So I look at a global level, there really is no standard. There's no language. There's no way of carving it up for a particular audience. If you were to take something like the conch, the conch has distinct engineering requirements in it it says that when we go and lend uh when we sell a product and we have a tertiary product that may be insurance that we cannot tick a tick box on the website and take that as an indication that the consumer is willing to buy that product and that's because somebody did that and that's why that regulation exists and i think that's what's interesting as an engineer that's something we should surface to the correct audience but how can we do that within the regulation as it stands today. I think there's lots of complicated things around totting up as well. So when you take things like um, the Consumer Credit Act and then you add GDPR onto that and then you look at lending and pulling someone's credit record, it, it's not explicit, but it's implied when it's like when you add everything up that you couldn't take someone's credit record that has a notice of correction on it and automatically decision against it. It's There's nowhere does that say that, but every credit Bureau will tell you that you can't do that. And it's mm -hmm. hard to go and trace why that can't happen. But again, it's it's a direct like engineering requirement. And I think the other interesting thing about regulation is not, it's kind of what it infers, like it's very gray. It's not very clear. It, it's kind of for the business to find. And obviously that gives you, you know, a massive amount of lateral movement. But when it comes to engineering, we deal in black and white and we deal in binary. So how how do we turn these gray areas into black and white? And it's almost like what are the what are the questions that first the business must answer? that turn it into concrete requirements that we can then go and cascade to our engineers. I think the, probably the next thing that comes after that, which is the most important, which is how do we get away from point in time audit? If you're somebody that's responsible for the text on a loan or a mortgage that says, you, you know, the paragraphs in the, the MCOBs, for example, that have to be included when you lend and, and produce a mortgage, how do you know that those are on the documents? How do you know they're on the website? If you're the material risk taker, if you're the accountable person, how can you be sure that your engineering team hasn't fudged that somehow? Mm -hmm. Like we fundamentally lack the technology. And, and I think this is largely because there are not many technologists who understand this space well enough to say what's missing, but can do regulation that can look at the technology and say, we, we met, there's something missing here. Yeah. I mean, on that piece, not... what, sorry, sorry, yeah, just, sorry, just exactly on that piece. I mean, it's interesting. The people that are in the tech sector normally don't like reading massive amounts of legal documentation. It's a completely different type of skill, which is why that gap exists. And another issue is, just from my perspective, even with the fact that all this regulation exists inside the tech sector, our information is still getting shared elsewhere. I'm just currently going through a house purchase. And essentially, I'm looking at all the different credit uh, rating agencies that exist. And there's this one that knows all this stuff about me, another one that knows all this stuff about me. And I have to keep on going through just to check what my credit rating looks like. And I have no control of that. So even though we do have stringent regulations in certain areas, my data source still feels it's dispersed outside of my control anyway. Yeah. 
Definitely. And that's the kind of user end user view and impact of it, isn't it? Ed, you've been nodding your, your head there. What's your view in terms of trying to consume that some of these compliance standards and actually, I mean, I know from, from my personal experience, I had to work with a consultant to help me understand the GDPR. And then I had to kind of filter that out and work very closely with our developers to help kind of translate that into actionable yeah. things. What's your experience? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so I'm, I'm going to preface what I'm about to say by, by just saying that I cannot believe that I am about to start justifying regulatory bodies. It, it must be a sign of, of getting old. But um, ba back to, to, to the, one of the key challenges that Audrey was reflecting on, and, and, and Blin, of course, complimented, is I think that fundamentally there is a disconnect in terms of a technical team or a product team that, that ultimately needs to walk that line between feature, function, and thou shall do sort of the commandments, the regulatory commandments. And, and it's hard to understand and to learn to read between the lines. And from, from a regulatory body, I can, see, I can see some of the reasons why that is the case. And it's simply because the, the government bodies are not trying to prescribe how things get done. So what they are trying to prescribe is the outcome and to give some sort of a guidance. In some cases, it's very, very specific, very strict. In some other cases, it's much more subject for interpretation. And, and what they are trying to do is to guide companies towards a, a particular set of outcomes. How you do it? And I think that's where a lot of the disconnect sometimes happen. Um, previous experience, I can only relate to my own previous experience, ultimately is, is, is about a recognizing that there are going to be things that you're going to get wrong and understanding which are the things that you can just simply not get wrong because the effect of not being compliant, it becomes onerous. So in those cases, you may want to look into partnering with third parties or definitely, definitely hiring that technical expertise or that, that legal expertise that helps you translate that into your requirement. Uh, but probably regardless of which route, which path you take, it's going to be, for me at least, it has been one of ensuring that as you go defining your, your features and the different services that you want bring into market, make sure that the, the dialogue between your legal team, your compliance team, your risk team, your product team, and then of course your technology team is as, 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 as close as possible. Yeah, okay, great. You talked a bit there about um, potentially, you know, working with experts or outsourcing. Where do we think the responsibility still lies in terms of, um, that kind of ownership side of things if you're I outsourcing i love this question because i think i think that we all know that you can offshore or you can you know subcontract the work but the responsibility stays with you there is no other way around it and 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 surprisingly i have seen many many instances with you know different companies where the the default approach was well if i am going to be running on aws and aws is pci dss service type ergo i don't need to worry about that or you know you know aws may give me all these tools to look into uh, data leakage and therefore i have a solid solution for gdpr and whether technically that might be the case, at the end of the day, something happens. It doesn't matter how many people you have subcontracted the work to. It doesn't matter if you actually had, you know, the, the guidance of the FCA, for example, you're still 100% responsible and 100% expected to comply with all the applicable regulations to your market space. Okay. And Aubrey, what's your view? I know I think you mentioned you're moving to work for a much larger company in your next inter interim role, potentially a bit of a legacy um, project. Um, just tell us a little bit about how you think compliance um, will impact that being a very large legacy project. Well, 
having done this before now, I know to face security and I know to face compliance head on and to understand it and to get to grips with it. Um, having traversed the conch before, when you look at the conch, it's never just the conch. You have to look at whether you know consumer credit, credit lending covers land, for example, and that's something that sits in the MCOB. And it also backhauls into the Markets and Financials and Services Act. And then you've got the Data Protection Act and then GDPR. And it starts to cascade. And for any one of these regulations, there's probably about five or six sitting behind it that have their own evaluations that you have to burst into and then come back. And there's also some really interesting points where it sort of annexes cause it to split in terms of time. So if you had a customer before a point in time, you can choose to apply the regulation at one point or another point. And that's your choice as a lender. It's quite interesting how that works. So facing into this sort of new stuff, this is insurance for me. So this is a new area, ICOBS. Um, I'm I'm getting to grips. I'm already hearing people talking about regulation. I think having been through finance, what's interesting is that the policy papers and statements released on um, operational risk and operational resilience um, last year were particularly interesting because they've shifted dramatically from the bank's organize, the bank's view of what is critically important towards how it impacts the consumer and now what is critically important is is gauged by how it will impact the consumer so it's very much like an fta centric view of things and i think we've seen industry concentrated risk around aws which has been quite interesting and seeing the reactions from the regulators around de-risking that um i would say that insurance isn't as prolific on aws and i think adoption is slowly increasing but i suspect in the next three to five years we're going to see a very similar um challenge around too many folks being on particular platforms and having to de-risk that um which takes us back to that really interesting question of like oh do you multi-cloud do you abstract and the stuff that we were talking about a while ago we said was all you know not going to work out and and just diminishes value in the cloud we're right back there because ultimately you could end up with a situation where you do have industry level concentrated risk on a particular provider so things are changing i think that it's more pertinent to us to understand this stuff at many, many levels. So not just as uh, you know, CTOs, our job is to understand an awful lot of this. Um, I think if you've ever been through an audit, one of the persistent challenges that you face, which is how do, how do I do sustainable engineering and not have to go for these massive assurance reviews, which cost half a million a pop, which are fully led by an external, which cost another half a million when you have to do the reconciliation after you've done your remediation. It, that for me is not a sustainable engineering model. And so it comes back to, again, how, how do I start embedding this stuff so it has some traceability? How do I start to embed? The reason we wrote this code was because of this regulation. And it's, you know, when we look at the model we've built, we have regulation, which is usually informed by law. And then we go and wrap a control around it. And then we build some guardrails and, and you largely walk, work in that framework. But I think as most of us know, often the lineage between all those things gets lost and becomes very hard to challenge. And when you start to see things like deep packet inspection on the cloud, you almost certainly know that's been lifted directly from an on-prem environment. And, and it's those sort of things, you know, the people that are going to challenge that are the people that are the most modern, which is the frontline people again. So it, it keeps coming back to how do we do a better job at communicating this stuff to the frontline people? How do we make it more consumable? Essentially, do the same thing that I guess I'm looking at security at. I'm trying to make security a product and make it more consumable and look at the audience and look at the people and deliver it. How do I, how do I get the goal that I want? You know, the spreadsheets that we deliver with 900 pages to the side that we're almost all certainly used to getting make your eyes bleed and you want to stop immediately. Like, how do we do a better job at that? Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's been very tough. Though, those spreadsheets trying to get, get, get your head around them totally. So I think we've spoken before potentially about how reducing or understanding the scope can help you, um, manage these projects a little bit better. Ed, how can you, how do you think managing scope can help you manage comply, a compliance project or continuous compliance, I, I guess? It goes back to the previous comment. I mean, you you have to be ruthless. And, and to be honest with you, I mean, this is any any product officers or any product people in the audience, you, you, you all know that, that the key to success, the key to actually coming up with a valuable MVP that then has an opportunity to flourish in the right way or, or towards the right areas of functionality that you want to provide to your own customers, ultimately is going to boil down to a very ruthless, very clinical approach to how are you managing your, your scope. So I think 
I think that the scope side of things is, is not necessarily the, 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 the challenging bit. I think that the bringing that expertise, that additional expertise from your risk officers or for your compliance team and finding that, that, that tractable ground where you continue to have clarity of what's on your next release, what is on your backlog, what are the features that you know you need to start developing. It doesn't, it doesn't get skewed to become one of, oh, well, we have to do this because the compliance asks us to, or, or it tells us. This is very easy. If, if, you don't, if you don't fully appreciate the, the subject, it becomes very easy for somebody to start driving the scope, but fear, you know, fear of, well, if we don't do this, the FCA is going to, to slap us with 10 billion pounds. And that's not going to be the case. Um, so yeah, I think is of course, ruthless management of the scope, but within that management of the scope, understanding what are the aspects of the regulation that, that we have to comply and how is that being translated into the code or the service or the securities of the controls that you're going to be rolling out on your next release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And Glenn, do you think there's other ways that companies can manage the risk, the risk around complying? I guess we need to make sure that it's not just a tick box exercise. Well, to start with, some organizations are perfectly happy with just a tick box exercise. You know, <laughs> they, they feel that de devalues the risk enough. And, you know, they some of them don't want to invest into actually imp implementing proper security procedures and compliance procedures throughout their entire organization. Um, but obviously most, you know, hopefully most CTOs would see that there is value in at least, you know, doing the basics and ensuring that um, you are protecting yourself from, you know, the common issues that do exist. So, you know, as as with all these things, you know, it's understanding what you actually need to care about, you know, what, what data do you hold, where does it set, who has access to it? And, you know, hopefully you're in a position where, as Ed said, you know, you understand what the actual risk is, you know, whether you need to go spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds against a solution where it's really it's just such a low risk it's not worth doing that type of investment as long as you've got you know basic barriers in place to ensure that you are protected in some way um you know as you're talking about trying to embed this culture into it is a culture change into the way the organizations work this is why the developers that you have to start your business may not be the right developers you need to go to the next stages you know the developers that started were quick you know get things built get products out the door they may not want to go through these processes and so maybe you know there's going to be a natural rotation of your team where they potentially already have experience of this or you are needing to obviously train your team to understand why these activities are important, why these, um, you know, extra tests or extra precautions you put in place are going to be valued to the business. Um, so obviously with that as training, mentoring, and obviously keeping an eye on how things are pr progressing. And I think we touched a few times, you know, or outsourcing what you can, you know, some, especially developers, they love to build solutions from scratch for no reason, like their own email server or, you know, something like that, which you just don't need to do. You don't need to go to the level. So it's about identifying what is the core part of your business. What can you, if you do need to be compliant quickly, what can you outsource to third parties? And obviously what is your value? And obviously it means that you've reduced the scope from that standpoint, focusing on what your value is as a business, rather than having to worry about every SMS API call that you've got out there or anything like that mm -hmm. yeah i totally agree and aubrey you met you talked about um traceability now having limited experience in the compliance how often do these do the actual standards themselves change so in terms of having to continually ensure that you're keeping up to date with the standards and then you can actually trace those back to changes that have been made I suppose it's not actually that often, but I think what we do often have is like consultations that happen and drafts, draft standards that are released and, and they start to emerge and, and kind of that's the time to get ahead of those things. I suppose the, the question is more pertinent if you are the material risk taker for something. So if you think about how, I mean, the FCA has said that there are more material risk takers being identified on, I think, purely like a quantitative number than there, there ever were before, and which means that an awful lot of your remuneration is built into bonuses and, and linked um, 
vehicles with the organization you work for. So they're often deferred over many years, that they take years to vest. And so the deeper you get into your role as material risk taker, the longer it takes to actually get paid. And there's quite a lot because you're subject to malice and clawback. And I think from that perspective, when you're on the hook for something, you kind of want to ask the question, how do I know this is being done? You know, it, the higher up you are, imagine you've got three portfolios or maybe one portfolio, or three initiatives in them, each one with 300 people building some sort of regulated product. And, and you start to say, OK, it's <laughs> probably a lot of regulation that applies to me. How do I know all the things are being done at this point? How do I how do I even know that this this particular line, this block of text that has to be like for like that sits in the MCOB and pasted exactly as is exists on this website? And how do I know when it's changed? How does the person that because I'm probably just accountable at this point, who's the person responsible and how do they know it's changed? And, and the fact is we have nothing for that. We have no answers. <laughs> but yeah. there, is, there is no no way of doing that. And I think that's where it becomes very tricky. And so the question is, you know, it, it's less so much around the routine of like things that are changing. Um, I, I think there is a potential, and I've looked at this like interesting thing where we start to see global regulation and lots of them designed at like Basel level and they trickle down and we see largely similar implementations around the world. GDPR and the Chinese privacy standards largely look quite similar. Things like the California Privacy Rights Act is very different to GDPR. Is there a way to map between those two things? Is there an ontology that could be used to bind them together and classify them and get from one to the other, which would allow them to move faster? Again, this is largely a fact that there's, there's not a substantial amount of innovation in that space, and we, we we lack, I think, that technology investment, and we haven't applied a ton of product thinking to this space as to, you know, who are the people today that are likely to consume this? I think yesterday there was probably a particular audience of people consuming regulation, and they were probably the largely compliance and legal folks on one side. But if we look at today's executors, they are our engineering capability, and we're not delivering it in a way that they can consume it. Yeah. Yeah, you talked about um, moving faster there. And I just wondered what you thought, Ed, you mentioned about product teams. Do you feel that product or system development agility is affected when you add the kind of the compliance layer or Certainly. multiple compliance layers, I guess, onto it? Certainly, 100%. Uh, and, and, and I think it's multiple layers, indefinitely, because it's, it's very, very seldom that a, a company it's going to be contending with only one regulation. I mean, if you are, if you are in the in the you know B two B two C or or B two C, definitely GDPR is going to be one that affects you. But it's unlikely that it's just going to be that one. So um, the the challenge, and it is always an ongoing challenge, and and I'm, I'm absolutely looking forward to Audrey's solution. Because I think I think that that's exactly the right idea. Finding a way to codify into some sort of a language that allows you to express all these these uh, regulate, regulatory interdependencies. So so do keep me posted. I'm definitely <laughs> subscribing to your to your feed. But um, when it comes down to agility, and uh, and again, depending on the stage in, of the journey where your company is. If you are literally startup, you're you're going to be going after the motto of move fast and break stuff. Unfortunately, there are certain elements in regulation that you just cannot ignore. And you cannot take the iterative approach of, well, let, let me see if I can just do, you know, 20% of regulatory compliance, and then on my next release, I will do a little bit more and a little bit more. So, so that iterative approach. There are many, many areas of the regulation that just do not apply to. You have to have everything and you have to have it pretty much from day one, within reason. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is, is, is antithesis, antithetical to, to what all the agile principles that we have been using to build, you know, this thriving community of companies, you know, being created, flourishing, uh, uh, especially, especially in, in the UK. So, once again, ruthless approach to your to your requirements, early involvement on from a, a an expert, whether it's risk compliance or 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 uh, other type of of, of compliance. Um, 
moving a little bit more into the start, you know, out of the startup into more of the scale up phase. Usually you're going to find that teams have found a way to make this part of the day to day. So, so typically you will have uh, a group that is looking at keeping an eye on the relevant regulations. What I have found in my own personal experience and what I have observed in other companies is that as you start to grow, at the beginning, you start with, with a group of people that know everything about everything. And, and that helps a little bit on the agility because the person that is trying to read the regulation and trying to come up with, with what it really means may be the product owner, which also is the guy that is going to be testing or might be the gal that is going to be writing the code. Once you start growing up, however, you're going to start having additional things. So your function of the product is probably going to be more discrete. It's going to be a product team that is not necessarily going to be the same as, as your development workforce. The same will apply to your compliance team. And with this introduction of additional groups, departments, teams, any, whatever you want to call them, then invariably there is going to be the introduction of these silos something that as a scale up, you're going to find a way to try to overcome. But that is going to impact your, your agility. Um, there will be, again, my experience, I can only relate to that. I have seen sometimes that the, the product management approach will be to try to become these, the, the, the interpreter of the, the, the requirements advice, make sure that your, your regulation stakeholder, your representative is still very much part of the team, of the development team, of the product team. Um, um, keep, keep that connection really, really close. Yeah. Because in many cases, some of the traps that you're going to find is, as I said at the beginning, it's not just one regulation that you have to comply to. It's probably two, three, four, or five. And the moment that these are starting to combine, it's the, the complexity also compound as well. Yeah, yeah, difficult to understand all of those and then the conflicts between those as well. Mm -hmm. and I think I've worked in, obviously, with bigger organizations, you've been able to have a person in the team full time who's been able to support the compliance projects. But I think sometimes it has you know, some hours or consultant time that's been able to support the team as well. Mm -hmm. But important to have that kind of consistent um, advice, I think, as you go. So sure. we've talked quite a bit about uh, people and process, I think. But Glyn, is there a cloud provider that makes this easy, easier? So, I mean, everyone's got their own tastes. I mean, I prefer to work on AWS as itself, but, um, you know, the cloud helps you create, um, you know, calculate positively the risk reward piece with the shared security, well, shared responsibility model that all the cloud offers provide. You don't have to worry about data centers and all that stuff. You know, everything's, you know, the hardware piece is already in place, some of the networking, obviously. Um, but again, you know, compliance and security is not just about the cloud, but you know, I, it's definitely, I consider it a lot easier to handle in those circumstances. When it comes to the individual cloud providers, you know, you've got the big three. Um, AWS does have a compliance manager in place. It's okay, but I think I still think it's quite complex to use. Um, and then they obviously have other tools as well, like Macy. But with, um, yeah, so yeah, AWS has the audit manager. That's what they call it. Azure has the compliance manager. That's the one I think is the easiest to set up. But again, with both of those two systems, you can, you know, configure them up, choose which frameworks you need to be compliant to, and then they do a lot of analysis for you and give you reports. So therefore, you can constantly see in almost real time how, you know, how compliant you are against certain things. But again, it doesn't cover everything. There's still things that could happen inside the code, which do things that shouldn't be in place. But it's a nice safety net to at least have something in there straight off. Um, and GCP, I do feel lack a little bit in this space. You know, they have their D DLP, is it? The, yeah, the data loss prevention tool, um, which is, you know, only part of a compliance thing. It doesn't go to the same level. But as always, these cloud providers are always um, pushing forward and doing, you know, increasing their service offerings and improving their system there. Another thing about the Azure system that I like is the fact that it does actually tie into AWS services in some way as well. So you do actually get overall um, 
um, like either either like how much you're spending from a revenue perspective. I think some of the compliance stuff they tie in there as well. So that's already starting to deal with the hybrid approach that you mentioned before. That I think all be mentioned before about you know the need of potentially having to split your systems across different cloud providers in itself as well. So AWS is good, and I, I prefer that from a development perspective. I think Azure is just a little bit simpler from a compliance piece. I'd be interested to know um, Aubrey's thoughts on this. I know she's got more Microsoft certifications than I knew existed. Um, <laughs> so. They're actually pretty old now. Um, what I would always say is, like, if you've ever done the, the whole AKS, EKS experience, what you'll, you'll find that provisioning AKS is incredibly simple on Azure and it's accessible. And when you look at the Amazon way of doing it, it's far more involved, far more granular, and there's a lot more composition there. And I would say that it's very reflective of the audiences that I think both are built for. When you're coming from that Microsoft background, it's very much, it used to be a walled garden, but it, it's quite integrated and there's a particular audience and they work in an enterprise way and it's very much about onboarding. And I think AKS was very insecure when you used to provision it. And I think when you looked at EKS, EKS was, but you know, by default couldn't do anything. And most things in AWS are like that. They don't go out straight to the world. They're quite locked down. I think that secure by default thing and, and the accessible world of Microsoft are very distinct. But obviously you've not, you noted that, that, you know, the policies on the global policy management on, on Azure is much stronger. Um, AWS in some senses have caught up, I think over time. Um, you mentioned Macy, which is a great tool for identifying uh, PII through your system. I think one of the challenges of that for a long time has been that it's been very US centric, and you know we haven't had many options outside the US for 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 using that. And I think probably the other most notable thing here is that most of the stuff that you'll see on the cloud is focused on security because security is binary enough to be able to be targeted in that way. You can quite easily say. This should be true or false. You shouldn't do this. When you see things like Chekhov taking, you know, holding the market because we can go and scan our infrastructure and say what is a good and good, uh, bad practice, it's because from a code perspective, you can take that code, turn it into an abstract syntax tree, walk it, and start to understand that you have a access control list and it's attached to something, and that has a meaning, that relationship, and and that's why it's easy to go and turn security into to something that's actionable in code because you have that syntax tree and you have enough meta to, to to join the dots. The challenge has always been with regulation is that one, it targets business. Two, there is no standard, so it's impossible to walk this stuff. The first part is even just representing it in some sort of digital way because that is not a standard in itself. And then how do you say, hey, business, this is 2.2.2 of the conk. We need you to say what you mean by how do you treat the customer fairly and how do you pay due regard to the customer? That's the first step. And if you were a lending company, you might say, well, we wouldn't lend to somebody over 80 years old because it would be responsible. And there you go. That's the first thing that you would implement in your lending engine, and it directly traces. And so, again, we fundamentally lack the language to take something that at the moment has no standard all over the world and turn it into something that's digital and then create the, hey, business, this is what you need to say. And then this is the, And then you have a graph of how you communicate this through the business and a graph that will change as those artifacts change if we had the technology to do it. That example you just gave me there, though, does concern me a little bit because obviously these regulations are a little bit broad. And you said, you know, treat the customer fairly. And you gave the example of if anyone's over 80, they shouldn't be given a loan because it'll be irresponsible. But wouldn't that be perceived as discriminatory in some cases? And obviously, yeah. there's that piece there about com companies' po policies that they're actually incorporating against the government policies and and that it's one example so yeah. if somebody was 80 would you give them a hundred thousand pound loan taking into account their financial conditions and what it what what the really example is that as a business mm -hmm. you need to describe how you treat the customer fairly and those conditions around that and what it does is drive out very explicit requirements that will probably end up in a decisioning engine and an evaluation engine and and that's the the missing connection right we have this abstract text somewhere in random formats and we have no way to represent then we need to build the model on top and we need to present the questions to the business to make it very clear mm -hmm. and those tr tr translate directly into requirements and together you could build a graph 
of those things and and mm. that means that when things change we would be in a much better condition to say ah somebody has updated something and all these people in this chain must know about it or this regulation draft will change all these things it, it's doable it's obviously a, a massive piece because like i said things like the conk touch seven other distinct pieces of regulation are <laughs> really difficult to one person me cannot model all those things <laughs> and i think i think that's that's the probably the key takeaway of, of all these particular subjects is that while different cloud providers and and you have your your, your pick of, of choice obviously will try to make certain things more more user friendly they typically tend to be the ones that are fairly binary exactly as it was explained I mean, security data privacy they data, data leakage those are problems that that seem more more close to have a, a fairly well, i don't want to say it's very solvable. Forward, they are more solvable exactly right but then when if, if that was the extent of the regulation then you know happy days everybody will be we probably won't be having this this podcast to start with but because of the added complexity, and just taking an example that that Audrey was was flagging, I mean, it's not just necessarily because you happen to be 80 years old. So, so there is a whole set of rules, and no cloud provider out of the box is going to be giving you that, because a, it's not it's not really that profitable for them. I mean, let's face it. I mean, they they go for for generic services that everybody can use, but they give you some of the building blocks. I mean, artificial intelligence, you know, Google's engine that now are pretty much available in every cloud provider. Those will go to, to, to help alleviate the problem. But ultimately, it will be about finding an easy way to translate literally inches and inches of documentation into this digital representation of this is the graph. This is the path that you need to take to comply with this particular bit. So yeah. it's an interesting problem. I mean, there is there will be yeah. a lot of money for whomever happens to crack this knot. <laughs> there is a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. Great, thank you. And I think we've mainly covered most of the topics that we wanted to cover. I can't see that we've got any questions just yet. If you have got any questions, pop them in the ask a question. Um, but I've got one for now, which maybe we can each, or you can each um, just let me know what you think. But what advice and suggestions would you share when selecting third party providers to help accelerate your compliant solutions build? Uh, Aubrey, is there any kind of key yep. <laughs> key advice or suggestions that you'd give? Go in armed. I mean, read this stuff. I don't know how many meetings you, everyone sat in and, and someone said, well, the regulation says we can't do that. And, you know, when that first started happening to me, I said, OK, well, what regulation are you talking about? And no one could tell me that was the first problem. And when I actually found out and read this stuff and, and became more knowledgeable on the subject, it turned out that most people didn't know what they were talking about. So I think that I would evaluate the same way that I would evaluate any technical supplier is to, to understand the material myself and to understand how it applies to the product that we're building and to ask the relevant questions. And if, you know, maybe they have the wrong folks in the room, you know, give them a second chance and ask them to find the right folks. And, you know, I guess it's about if you say you can do this stuff, right, let's 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 test the water on this. But I, I think you you absolutely must know this stuff we've used the term responsible a few times i think it's potentially the wrong term i think actually what we're searching for is accountable the business is always accountable and and the responsibility can really sit with anybody but that's not what's important it's the accountability so we are always accountable so we can go and find a supplier responsible for this stuff but the buck does stop with our organization i think that's that's the asset test and that's where you know we have to yeah apply the most sort of intelligence and pressure and, and responsibility yeah, what you just mentioned there, I think it's really, really valuable. Well, really valid because I've seen several times people say, "Oh no, we can't host our product in the cloud." In the cloud, this is about ten years ago, but essentially they could. They just didn't understand the regulations, so that was their assumption they couldn't do that. And then also, still talk about third-party providers. You know, third-party providers have to follow your compliance requirements. So as I mentioned, you know, at the start where they would have been selected for cost and ease of use, you know, now, you know, you need to rethink what that is. So as Aubrey mentioned, you know, you need to check to see what they can do, you know, do a gap analysis to see where they're missing, um, vet them if you, if you have the resources to be able to vet them yourself or at least see if anyone else has vetted them. 
Um, but there is an expectation of uh, protection from any third parties that you use. But obviously, with compliance requirements, you do need to be much a bit more thorough with that process to ensure that's actually in place. And just to twist it a little bit further, libraries. You know, if like Log4j, prime example, you're not dealing with an actual company, you're dealing with a library, which is supported by one poor guy somewhere in probably Eastern Europe. No one knows, you know, essentially there's there's no history of where these things are coming from. It's going to be much harder to do that yourself without having your own auditing in place to see whether it's not only secure, but also still compliant with what you actually uh, need to be following. Right. In fairness, there's a good old team around Log4j, but JNDI was just, why would you bake that into? <laughs> exactly. I think also, I mean, there will be certain rules of thumb, I guess, that that, that you want to take. So when, when making that type of decision of should we build, should we buy, should we develop, should we rely on somebody, I think, I think it, for me, it is, there is an element of how strategic solving this problem is for the company. If it's something that is strategic, very core, that we think it's going to be adding value. And by value, I don't mean, you know, the shareholder value, although that is important, don't get me wrong, uh, is if it's strategic in nature, then I will, I will look a little bit closer as to why can we not do it internally. If complexity is also a key, a key element that you want to use in making the decision. If it's a particularly complex problem, I mean, in some cases you want to do, you know, a, a huge level of reconciliation, payment reconciliation, as an example. Um, I, it, it sounds straightforward, trust me, it isn't. And uh, there will be third party companies that specialize on that. So, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be throwing names. I'm not associated with any, but if you Google them, I mean, definitely you're going to find companies that and that and that can do that for you. So I suppose is is horses for courses at the end of the day. What is valuable to you? What is the strategic? What is the internal capacity, the internal resource, internal understanding on how to solve that problem? And how credible is your third party provider? I mean, if it's a company that just popped up in the last two months, suggestion, mm, look, look, keep looking. Keep looking. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So we've had a couple of questions pop up. So let's just see if we can get these ones um, answered. So there is growing interest in using techniques such as a formal reasoning as formal reasoning to help codify and automate some aspects of compliance. What does the what does this change and does this mean compliance versus speed are no longer counterpoints to each other? Anybody want to have a crack at that one? So the, the folks applying formal reasoning have been trying to do that for some time um, and they're still probably going to be going for some time because the source material is incredibly tricky. Uh, and I think, again, the, the, sometimes the, the best approach to this, and it's kind of interesting, we talked about on the prep session for this, the, the idea of that sometimes you just don't get caught and that if you did get caught, it, it, it doesn't really matter because you can carry on and that and that there's a, there's a good film i think it's they call it net present value in oil but actually the cost of doing damage is less than the cost of doing business so you just get caught and pay the fine right and it, it it's a it's an interesting idea i think that again when you look at like conk 2.2.2 for example when it says that we must the two key things are treating the customer fairly and paying due regard to the customer it's it doesn't mean anything and i spent so long looking at that statement and it was it was a lawyer um who said to me actually the business needs to tell you what they mean by treating the customer fairly it's for the business to tell you that and then it was pretty clear to me that quickly inf informed my my engineering choices and i think that maybe is a better way to do it. I don't think there is a good way to do it. We have a lot of law. There is no structure to it. It's completely arbitrary. Some of it is incredibly old. In fact, we have the, the caveat in most of our laws that he is interchangeable with she because he is littered throughout the Consumer Credit Act in every piece of our law. There's no almost no mention of a woman. You know, imagine you could possibly have credit as a woman if you looked at our, our law. And it's not likely to change anytime soon. And it's this stuff is so enshrined and, and unlikely to change anytime soon. Could you apply mathematics to it? No, not really. You know, I, I think there's a different approach. And I think it comes from really, again, looking at those audiences, looking at the people that need to consume it and starting to 
broadcast and surface those things that particular audiences need to answer and, and then turning those into explicit requirements. And then again, you have some sort of network of information that is easier to traverse and easy to understand when things in it change and what they would affect node by node. Um, that That is my approach. That is the approach that I'm working on. Um, good luck to those folks still trying to apply uh, formal reasoning to it. <laughs> Great, thanks, Aubrey. And I think one last question that we'll be able to squeeze in. So some interesting points earlier about startups lacking, lacking dedicated people to deal with compliance. How would the panel suggest a startup with limited resources best deal with heavy compliance um, requirements, say F FCA regs, I think has been suggested as an example there? I'll source it uh, again. <laughs> Subject to the criticality of the regulation that you're going to be dealing with. I mean, if uh, if you are if you are a fintech, um, it, it there are uh, many 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 companies, advisories, consultancies that will give you that a expertise, b guidance, c manpower or personal power to actually deal with what are the requirements that you need to comply? How do you need to approach a particular problem? Um, and it's not just constrained to, to FinTech. Uh, I mean, my exposure is, is, is predominantly on the, on the FinTech industry, but I am, I am absolutely convinced that you will find the same level of support from third parties, from healthcare, from edutech, from, from real tech, you name it. But yes, yes, don't be afraid to, to offer outdoors the work not the responsibility because if nothing else as you walk away from this session if there is only one thing that you want to remember is that regardless of how much third parties and cloud providers you use you continue to be in the hook 100 percent of the time yeah. yeah and with the organizations i've seen some hire internally it's quite high it's hard to hire internally because even these guys facebook's accounts don't clearly state that they're in this sector they cover it up because they're they've already got enough work from their network um but I think every company I can think of I've worked with that's gone through ISO for the first time I've always brought in a consulting company to help them build the processes, identify their gaps, and obviously work with the team to actually get to that type of compliance. So it's a very common approach to do that rather than just trying to inhale all of it yourself and then try and bring it into the team if, you, if there is no experience already within the team to incorporate this. Yeah, and I think that's a great point to end on actually in terms of making sure that you understand the, the responsibility piece as, as a business. Uh, so great. Thank you very much to uh, Ed, Aubrey and Glim for taking the time with us today. Um, I've popped some of your social links um, for people to connect with you. So I hope that's OK. And then I also just wanted to mention that uh, next Friday, same time at half 12, is the CTO Craft Bytes, the future of mobile applications. Um, so feel free to sign up for that one if that's something of interest. But yeah, thank you very much for your time, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank Happy you. Friday. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.